Today I'm going to talk about how to compute minimum cuts and connect the components in a communication avoiding way. To achieve good performance on a large scale parallel machine, we know it's not enough to just consider the arithmetic operations of an algorithm. It's also very important to reduce the communication of the algorithm. And these costs are associated with the latency and the bandwidth of a parallel machine. And these costs are difficult and expensive. These metrics are difficult and expensive to uh, reduce. This is why for our algorithms, we model the communication costs and in our experiments, we measure the fraction of time spent communicating. We consider a set of P processors, each with their own local memory. These processors communicate with each other through an idealized network. The network transmits messages in an asynchronous and out of order fashion. If we want to ensure that the messages that have been sent so far have reached their destination, we need to explicitly um, synchronize and call a barrier. And now we um, group the operations together. So between two barriers, um, the operations that occur, uh, we group together and this is what we call a super step. So more specifically, in each super step, we allow every processor to send an arbitrarily large message to every other processor and the processor can receive a message from every other processor. Now remember that the messages, they are only guaranteed to have arrived at the very end of the super step and so they can be used in the next super step. And now we just measure the total length of the messages that have been sent and received by a specific processor and this is what we call the communication volume of the processor in a particular super step. Now to get the communication volume of the whole algorithm we just um, take the maximum communication volume of any processor in a super step and we sum the communication volume over all super steps. And this naturally um, if we re reduce the communication volume, this naturally translates to um, reducing the need for a high bandwidth. So we reduce the costs associated with that. And also notice that this number of super steps corresponds to the longest path of messages in the algorithm that depend on each other. So this naturally leads us to reduce the costs associated with latency. Now, in our work, we considered two graph problems in this model. Graph problems can be very challenging because some uh, traditional approaches like graph searches are problematic in parallel. The first problem that we considered is that of computing a minimum cut. A cut is a partition of the vertices of the graph into two non-empty sets. And then we look at the edges which have endpoints in both partitions. These cross the cut. And if we find a cut with smallest possible weight of all of the crossing edges, then this is a minimum cut. So we want to cut as, uh, as little weight as possible. In an undirected graph, this corresponds to the edge connectivity of the graph. So this is just the number of edges that need to fail for the graph to become disconnected. Moreover, a minimum cuts can be used to cluster the vertices of a graph. If we recursively partition the graph according to a minimum cut and stop once a, a good um, criterion is reached, then it can be shown that we get clusters with nice properties such as low diameter. Now let's turn to our results. There has been previous work on the problem in our model. And um, notice here, um, that the number of super steps is sort of three logarithmic factors and for the communication volume um, the most the biggest term is an n squared over p and then there are four logarithmic factors and so we reduce the number of super steps and the communication volume so the number of super steps is now just one logarithmic factor if we take a closer look at it we see it's always big O of log p the number of processors but if the graph is sparse and m over n squared um, is large, then it's log p over n. And then if the number of processes is less than the number of vertices, this is constant. And this turned out to be important in practice, this, this improvement for sparse graphs. And also the communication volume is uh, smaller than, uh, than, 
than the previous work by a logarithmic factor. Now, for our experiments, we implemented the algorithm using uh, um, the message passing interface and we measured its performance on pit steined. And um, yes, and so we measured the fraction of time spent in MPI compared to the overall time. And um, on the left, uh, you see the running times and uh, the the two times laid over each other and on the right you can see the fraction of time spent in MPI and you see that it's indeed low, ranging between 1% and 7% on a thousand cores. And this is on a sparse graph. We also compared our algorithm to two sequential baselines. We were unable to find any parallel implementations um, for the minimum cut problem. Um, and so we compared the two sequential ones. We started with the boost graph library as a comparison, which turned out to be very slow. So we beat the boost graph library even sequentially. This mostly comes from the fact that they use a, a different algorithm, which has worst complexity. And so we also implemented our own sequential baseline, and using a, which uses a similar paradigm, but optimized for a sequential execution. And also over this, we achieve a substantial speed up. Um, and then on denser graphs, we see that the communication uh, volume increases and we spend around 20% of the time communicating. And this also stresses why it's important to reduce the communication because this really limits ultimately the scalability. So the communication costs, they do not decrease if you have more processors. It only gets more complicated and expensive to synchronize. So keeping those low is really important. Um, now, the other problem we considered was connected components. Um, you will see later that there is actually a connection between the two problems and we were able to use similar ideas and the common uh, core set of ideas and uh, code for both problems. <clears throat> now here, uh, let's first start with a comparison with the theoretical results available in the model. You can see that there are two types of bounds that we see on the, the first bound you see it has log p super steps, but the communication volume um, scales arbitrarily with the number of processors. So it can scale more, but there is more communication going on for, in terms of the super steps. And then there are simpler algorithms which have very few super steps, but they are limited in scalability um, and they only scale as um, proportional to the average edge degree. And our algorithm is of the second kind. So we have very few super steps and the communication volume is good if the graph is dense. So you see it does not increase with the density of the graph. And this comes from the fact um, that we only treat very sparse subgraphs, as we'll see later. And we do see exactly what we would expect from the theory. So for sparse graphs, there is just not much parallelism to be expected, but we have good constant factors. Um, and on dense gra uh, denser graphs, we are able to ex uh, exploit parallelism. So in the plot, you see the, the red triangles. This is our code. And then we compared with the uh, boost graph library, the sequential baseline, which just uses some graph search. And we compared with um, the parallel boost graph library, which is a distributed memory code. And then we also compared with Galois, which is a shared memory uh, parallel code, so it does not scale beyond one node, and this is why you see the, that the Galois measurements are only up to 36 processors. Um, so you see, if we have enough parallelism, then we have better constant factors than all of the codes that we compared to. And we also wanted to further investigate um, why is it that we have these good constant factors, and it turns out that it is because of better caching behavior compared to the graph search. So you can see on the left, the number of cache misses incurred by the boost graph library um, is much higher. And we also measured the number of instructions and found that it does perform much fewer instructions than our algorithm, but the number of cache misses 
um, outweighs this in terms of the execution time um, sequentially. And on the other hand, you can see that Galois does perform slightly less cache misses, but the instructions are, it performs are very expensive, and so they, um, they are not able to benefit from having slightly fewer cache misses because their algorithm is inefficient in other terms. Okay, so now let's turn to some of the core ideas of our algorithms. A very simple idea of how we could compute connect the components in parallel is let's just choose some set of edges and then we merge the endpoints of those edges. And if we do this repeatedly until there are no edges, then the remaining vertices correspond to the connected components of the graph. Now, if we just choose edges arbitrarily, this gives very poor performance. For example, consider the following um, uh, worst case instance, we have square root of n copies of complete graphs on square root of n vertices. And then if we choose about n edges, it could happen that we choose edges that come from the same component. And so in every iteration of this algorithm, we would just uh, contract one of these um, components. And because there are square root of them, it would take square root of n iterations with a worst case choice of edges to contract. But notice that this seems like a very special choice and somehow an unlucky choice that all of these edges would end up in the same component. And we might have the intuition that most choices would lead to much better results than this worst case instance. And this is why we have some hope that choosing edges uniformly at random leads to good results. And this is indeed what we find. So, Again, the algorithm, we choose some uh, set of edges. We need to choose slightly more than a linear number of edges in the vertices, and then we contract them. And here, uh, to prove fast conversions, we use the result coming from minimum cuts. So a similar algorithm was, uh, was presented previously for minimum cuts, and the same kind of proof applies to this, um, this randomized procedure and we can show that only a constant number of uh, iterations are required. <clears throat> and now, of course, we still need to implement these steps um, in parallel, but this turns out um, to be feasible in just a constant number of super steps. Intuitively, all we really need to do these random selections is some information about how many edges are left so that we can uh, choose the probabilities correctly and contracting the edges can also be done independently uh, for the processors. And so overall we just get a constant number of super steps if we ch um, choose the parameters um, adequately. And now we go over to the minimum cut ideas. Here an idea, a similar idea of contracting edges has also previously been uh, fruitful and we build on those ideas. So what the idea is, what if we contract an edge, so we merge the endpoints of the edge, of an edge that does not go across these partitions, that form the partition that forms the minimum cut. Then the edges that form the minimum cut are unaffected and we can just repeat this until only the edges of the minimum cut are left. Now, of course, we don't know which edges are in the minimum cut. That is what we are trying um, to, uh, to find. But here again, the idea of randomness was very useful. And the intuition is that because the minimum cut um, has a small fraction of the total weight of the edges, choosing an edge pro with probability proportional to its weight there is a small probability that it will end up being an edge in the minimum cut because, well, it's a minimum cut, so it has a small weight compared to the overall weight. And this is one of the differences to in the connected components case where we just contract edges uniformly at random, but it's just a generalization because you can think of a weighted edge as just a set of parallel unweighted edges. And also notice that we can't just contract all of the edges, then we are left just with one vertex and that doesn't provide us with any useful information. So we need to keep some edges, uh, some vertices. Um, 
And here there comes in one of the key trade-offs for these kinds of algorithms. How much do we shrink the graph randomly and how do we proceed from there? And there, uh, there is a, a well-known lemma about how these two relate, how much you have to shrink the graph to get a certain probability of still maintaining the minimum cut. And previously, algorithms have taken uh, one of two very extreme choices, either contracting until only a constant number of vertices are left, then you get a very small probability of success, which is just 1 over n squared, and so you would need many, many repetitions of this process to get, um, to get uh, some success. Or the other extreme approach is to only shrink the graph by a constant factor and then copy the graph and proceed recursively and uh, this leads to a better work, but for our work it was important um, uh, to... we chose this parameter depending on the density of the graph. And so with the special choice that we make, this is what enables us to have fewer super steps on the sparse graphs, and this is also what allowed us to have the good performance in practice on the sparse graphs, is that really um, basically, like this whole recursion that you would have otherwise just collapses and uh, there is very little communication across the processors. Um, and finally, of course, we also need to provide implementations for, um, for these steps. So how do we really choose these edges uh, with probability proportional to their weight? How we do, con do we contract these edges? And this turns out to be uh, a non-trivial issue to achieve within the bounds that we um, did. So the previous work, they take log p log n super steps and they do some binary search using connected components and so this leads to a large um, number of super steps and it also is the reason why they have a larger communication volume. And here there is some ingenuity going into how we can do this in a constant number of super steps and interestingly um, this is uh, also slightly related to what we did for the connected components case. Now, in conclusion, we showed randomized algorithms for minimum cuts in connected components. We really focused on reducing the number of super steps. And overall, we got improved bounds for computing a minimum cut. And for connected components, we got an alternative approach, which for certain circumstances gave improved bounds and it has very few super steps as well. And in practice, we got very predictable performance, so the algorithms behaved how we expected them to. Um, yeah, overall, we were able to get a small fraction of time spent in the, in the um, MPI. Thank you, I'm open for questions.